Okay, Dr. Morris, looks like recording, so take it away. All right, welcome everyone. I will just get started here with my PowerPoint. Actually, I think I forgot to share my screen. That'll help. Okay. So, just keep questions for our school and health department personnel, because I know we have a lot today and pass on info as needed. So I noticed the email from MDHHS <clears throat> last week was sent on at 1230. So if I had checked my email in my rushing to get ready for the one o'clock meeting, I would add info, but hopefully you got information from us. If not, <clears throat> here it is. So our official recommendation, which is consistent with MDHHS's recommendation right now and the CDC guidance. Um, CDC still is recommending a 14 day quarantine and that still is the standard. However, you can reduce your quarantine to 10 days if you've not developed any symptoms or evidence of COVID-19 during your first 10 days from exposure which just a side note, if you have had symptoms, we shouldn't even be talking about ending quarantine. So I think that's kind of a, of an interesting caveat, but anyway. Um, and if you are able to continue monitoring symptoms for the full 14 days. So basically, if you have an individual who may not be able to do that, um, you know, if you worry about their reliability, or if you have maybe a student who is cognitively impaired um, and you just, you can't really follow those kinds of things, you might wanna stick with 14 days. Um, so again, 14 days is the standard. You can go to 10 if you feel like there's no question that they've started to develop symptoms and you can rely on them to continue to monitor themselves for 14 days and that they will stay home should they have any suspicion of symptom development. So there was mention in the CDC about seven days. MDHHS had made a vague reference to continuing to explore shorter quarantines based on testing availability, because that really is a, a big issue right now. Um, however, my comment on that is that with or without a negative test result, um, at least one in 10 people who leave quarantine at seven days will go on to spread COVID to somebody else. So the statistics on this, I have a graph on, or a table on the next page. Um, if someone leaves quarantine without a negative test, 10 to 20% of them are going to transmit COVID to somebody else. Um, if they had a negative PCR test that was collected within two days before they were released, um, between two to 8% of those people will go on to transmit it to somebody. And if they had a negative antigen test within two days before release, then about three to 12% of those people will go on to spread it. So again, to me, that's unacceptable risk. Um, here's the statistics. So our traditional 14 day quarantine. Oh, God. Oh, God. oh, can we, can you please mute your computers or phone? Thank you. Um, so at 14 days, if you're left out with no negative test, very, very low risk of transmission. It could be up to 3%. With negative testing, it's really about the same. Um, and that's just because our tests aren't perfect. At 10 days, again, it goes up about 10 times. So about from 0.1% to 1%. Um, with negative testing, it really is pretty similar. Um, again, we notice that antigen testing is not quite as reliable as PCR testing, but it's faster. So again, you can see between 10 to seven days, it is hugely different in my opinion. So I really, unless something changes with our science, um, I do not, I will not be recommending a seven day quarantine at any point unless something changes. 
Um, so I now want to go over the changes in the epidemic order. Um, this new order expires basically at midnight on the 20th. So things go back to normal in the morning on the 20th. Well, I but back up. <laughs> Misspoke there. A new order will replace this order on the 21st. Um, it'll be a while before things go back to normal, um, but there will be a, a different order, I'm sure, that will replace this one on the 21st. Um, so I went through both orders and to summarize the differences, in this new order, they added a definition for closed campus boarding school, which is addressed later on here, I'll explain. They also clearly defined what indoors means and what outdoors means. So in the order under um, number two, they made some changes under um, the capacity limitations and gatherings. Um, under the part where it says that it does not apply, um, they added after school programs so if you have children um, that are in after school programs like for K through eight, um, the gathering limitations don't apply to that. They also added CPR and swimming instructions and um, like different certification exams that couldn't be done remotely. So those have been added to the acceptance of gathering limitations. Um, they added to the gathering restrictions for particular type of facilities. They, for the prohibited, they added roller rinks and they took away skating rinks. So they did add some instructions later on about ice skating. So you can't roller skate anymore, but now you can ice skate. So that's a change. Um, in number four, under the gathering restrictions for facilities, they added that um, indoor dining like food courts have to be closed. So that was a loophole they closed up. And then letter E, they added um, some information about indoor and, ice, and outdoor ice skating rinks. So they clarif they specified those, um, or they clarified or specified how you can have ice skating legally. So again, that's all new. And then in the college and school sections, they added um, some provisions, um, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but in addition to that, the Section C had some wording changes. They took out the boarding school statement, and boarding schools are now addressed in a separate section. Um, and they also added that tutoring and academic support is permitted in schools. So gathering at any public or non-public school is permitted for the purpose of, it had previously said child care, um, providing for students in need, food, internet, etc. But now they've added tutoring and academic support. So if you have high school students who are struggling and you need to provide tutoring or academic support, you can have them in the building. Um, they've also added um, again, this section that's specifically for boarding schools, and they did define it in the definitions what a closed campus boarding school is. So I'll, I didn't break that out. You can refer to the order for that. They also added that gatherings at trade school and career schools are permitted, um, but only to the extent that they cannot be or completed remotely. And they did add that gathering at schools for the purpose of delivering career so basically um, at trade schools and at schools for career and tech ed um, that can't be done remotely. So those are new additions to the order. So again, I just wanted to summarize what was new or different. Everything else is exactly the same. All the other gathering requirements and limitations, all the masking orders, everything else is identical. Those are the only differences. Um, so again, this will be in effect until the morning of the 21st. And just like now, you know, likelihood they'll announce what the new order will be a couple days ahead of time. Um, so this was something um, I want to thank uh, Jason Jeffries from West Shore District and their superintendents. They were thinking of, of ways to help promote vaccination. And one thought that we will work on it probably won't come out until early January, um, 
but we're thinking of doing a joint press release with any superintendents or ISDs that are interested, um, basically stating that you know we in public health and schools that are interested in signing on to this um, want to promote community COVID vaccination as a way to help keep our kids in school. So we will work on writing that, but again, if there's any school districts or superintendents or principals or whoever might want to um, be included in this press release, you can just let me know, email me. And again, we likely won't, I don't foresee us getting this out until early January. Vaccination of the community as a whole won't happen for some time. Um, but again, just a thought as a way to help promote community uptake of vaccination so that hopefully we'll get better control of COVID so we can keep our kids in school. Um, last week I reviewed data. I provided slides of data from the weekly report that the state is putting out. So I'm gonna do that again today. Um, this data is as of the 5th. Um, there's always a bit of a delay. It's hard to pull data and make nice slides right up to that moment. But these slides are available um, at this website. So this just shows our trend in how many tests we're doing in Michigan. Um, so right around the Thanksgiving holiday, people weren't too worried about going in and getting tested. Um, but we're now starting to see that number increase. Um, this is the percent positivity of test results in Michigan. So right around that time when people weren't getting tested as much, the percent positivity was decreasing a bit, but now we're going back up again. Um, last time I included a really busy table that had the percent, or sorry, the turnaround time for tests for lots of different labs. Um, this time I just included some averages. This website down here has the turnaround times for every lab in Michigan. So if you're interested, you can look there. Um, but just again, for the ease of, of um, looking at this, um, <clears throat> most of us, if we were to be tested, would use a commercial lab or a hospital lab. Um, Hospital labs are a little deceiving because I think this mainly talks about, you know, if you're an inpatient. Um, and that's not most of us, luckily, because it's not taking into account the transport time. So for most of us, on average, it would take about four and a half days because you have to take into account the time it takes to get to the lab. <clears throat> um, our regions are one, I think, three, six, and seven. Um, and so on average, we're looking at, you know, three and a half, four to five days for test results, which is about the same as it was last week. Um, the percent positivity for the counties in Michigan is illustrated here. Um, some are getting a bit lower. Some are getting a little bit higher. So overall it looks as though we're mostly stable um but we i have the table later that goes over it exactly um but as a whole in michigan we're pretty well on that table you could see or on the line graph you could see um not hugely different um these are the confirmed cases that we've seen in michigan um, we're starting to level off. So again, within this week or the next week, we really should see if we're gonna see much of a effect from Thanksgiving. Um, as we're seeing more people getting tested, that will also have an impact on it. So these are the outbreaks. So again, um, long-term care facilities, this top line and schools are required to report outbreaks. So of course, we're gonna see the highest number in those. Um, the rest of the outbreaks really depend on public health to identify those. Um, employers are supposed to report cases to the health department, 
it's just sometimes a little harder to identify if there is an outbreak going on. Um, what I did here is I went through um, all of the non health care, child care, or um, the, what is it, corrections? These would be correction officers. They don't include prisoners in this. But all the other workplaces, I added up all of their outbreaks, and there were 331 of those um, compared to 231 in schools. These are not how many people. These are just individual outbreaks. Um, she did put together the cases over the last week that were involved in school outbreaks. So there were a total of 1,500 cases involved in outbreaks. 285 of them were new in the last week. 65% um, of them were in high school students. So even though high schools are not in session, we're still getting high school student outbreaks. Um, the rest were still in ongoing outbreaks. So outbreaks that have still continued to transmit and um, it kind of depends on how things are being counted with that. But, you know, as you can see, it's still the high schools that are the vast major are the majority of those cases. These are our hospitals. And again, I did not include that crazy big table that I was before just because it was so challenging. But this website here at the bottom um, is where you can get that information. Um, the links are right on the data page for the state website. But again, our regions are three, six, seven, and eight. Um, so it, it's good to see some consist, it's starting to show a pattern of a downward trend um, for us there. Um, still quite busy, still very busy hospital systems, um, but luckily a bit of a trend now going downward. This slide I showed you last time, this is last week and this is this week. So you can see that um, looking at cases that were completely investigated by public health, it went from 20% to 25%. Um, you know, as we've been discussing, there are just so many cases that public health just cannot completely investigate all of them. Um, but it has increased. So, you know, that's an extra 3,000 cases that were investigated. Of those 11,000 cases that were fully investigated, um, about a quarter of them were already in quarantine from an exposure and um, about, you know, 43% of them could identify how they were infected, um, where they were exposed. So just to see that things are getting a bit better, um, the state did sign a contract with a, a really great Michigan-based company. Hopefully we'll have that live within the next several weeks um, where we'll be able to send, basically send text messages to cases and they'll be able to fill an, on, an online survey to give us all their information. Um, and that tends to actually get better responses and phone calls. Um, as you probably know, people are not great about answering phones, but they're pretty good about answering texts. Um, so that should be a help in getting more responses for us, um, even when our workforce is really overworked. Um, just looking locally here, um, in Aranac, we did have a couple cases associated with an outbreak in the high school. Um, we've had cases in our, well, and Isabella had a couple, one staff, one student, and an outbreak. Um, and our counties have had some cases in the schools, um, but the majority have been community acquired. Um, District 10, none of them that were reported were, we were not told that they were associated with an outbreak. Um, and again, you know, all the cases that we've had have been community acquired. <clears throat> 
some are still in high schools, as you can see. And um, in mid, we're getting smaller numbers of school cases. I know some of their schools are um, remote only at this point. So look at the data as a whole. So one thing of note, um, Michigan's cases have been going down for two weeks now. Um, the percent positivity is pretty stable from last week. Um, in Central Michigan District, some of our counties have been going down for two weeks now. Um, many of them have been going down for at least a week. The percent positivity, unfortunately, is still hanging on. Um, the amount of testing we're doing is good. I mean, we want to see it ideally at about, um, I think they say around 1,500 or more is the ideal. Um, and so the percent positivities can be affected by testing volume, but for most of our counties, it has been good. I know Gladwin has been higher in the past, but um, things start to get overwhelmed at some point. Um, with District 10, um, again, trending downward for nearly all counties. I know Nuego County has had higher numbers. I think, what was it last week? So they had 20 cases a day on average last week and 29 cases a day um, this past week. So again, it, and then <clears throat> they had had, so basically five non-high school cases and one teacher case. So, um, you know, we're really leaving that to the schools to decide how they, you know, feel about their community transmission rates and how that's affecting their schools. Um, and I'm going to talk in a second about a list of things that I made up to kind of look at because I really there really is no absolute number to say yes you've passed this magic number and you need to then stop having school there really just is no evidence um I keep looking and I know states like Oregon and Wisconsin keep changing their numbers they keep increasing them other states have done the same but I just as we can see you guys can see too um having higher numbers in your community just doesn't seem to mean that you're going to have outbreaks in your school. You may have more, a few more cases in your school, but it doesn't mean you're going to have an outbreak in your school. And MID has had some decreases over the weeks as well. So I know, again, going through this data, I think is useful, but it's challenging because it doesn't necessarily mean much for your schools. So this is a draft. This is something that I came up with based on everything that I've read and that we've done and that we've seen. So this is not an authoritative thing that the state passed down. This is just something I'm working on and I wanted to review it with you guys and get some feedback. And then I can um, share it with some colleagues and with the state and see what they think. But I know last week we had talked about having some kind of a kind of a checklist of things to think about when you're deciding whether or not to be in person or virtual. So I started with, um, you know, do you have any issues with maintaining your safety and mitigation plans? So you know, are your classrooms too crowded? Um, do you have poor compliance with masking? Are your staff or students coming to school sick? Um, and then if you do have any in-school transmissions, so if you have cases that do occur between close contacts, just really closely evaluate the situation to see, was there any potential contributor? So was it because students were sitting too closely together? Was it because people were not wearing masks? Was it because of crowded buses? staff meetings, lunches, one-on-one -on -one instruction? And if so, 
can those be corrected? Um, <clears throat> and then look at your healthcare capacity. Are your staff and students that need to be tested, which would be those that have symptoms, and ideally, but not necessarily mandatory, those that don't have symptoms but were exposed, are they able to get tested when they need to get tested? Um, how long do your test results take to come back? Are those that are symptomatic and awaiting test results staying home? In other words, not coming to school, not coming to work. Is there any evidence that you can see that the lack of testing or the slow test result return um, causing any cases to be missed or leading to spread of illness? And then look at public health capacity. Is the amount of COVID, um, I put COVID-10, it should be COVID-19, I'm sorry, um, amount of COVID or the rate of the increase of COVID in the community exceeding public health's ability to identify um, you have all the school associated cases. If so, is there evidence your school, um, your schools have the ability to effectively identify the in, identify any increasing rates of staff or student absenteeism? Are you able to identify the causes of staff and student absenteeism? Are you able to identify and exclude staff and students with symptoms of COVID in a timely manner? Are you able, um, are you being notified by staff and students of their COVID test results, of their COVID exposures? Um, and are you able to act appropriately to any results of COVID-19 tests um, and exposures. So basically, if public health has gotten overwhelmed, have you been able to step in and, and fill that void? Is public health available for consultation in a timely manner to assist you with decision making as needed um, regarding COVID infections or exposed staff or students or any other related questions? And then um, community transmission rates. So are community rates of COVID-19 high enough or increasing rapidly enough to lead to such numbers of cases in staff and students that case investigations, contact tracing, and quarantine numbers are such that their disruptiveness to education outweighs the benefit of in-person education and that they cause concerns that all close contacts to cases and actual cases themselves may not be identified. So I put a note here saying, and again, this is my opinion, um, and also just lack of any published evidence, that there's no absolute value of community transmission or percent positive known for this to indicate schools must transition to remote learning. So <clears throat> there have been benchmarks published, but there's really no science that says at this number, it becomes unsafe. <clears throat> so my feelings on signs of concern may be that several COVID-19 infections are identified in close contacts while they're in quarantine. So you're seeing a lot of secondary infections occurring. So if, if you have a kiddo who's sick, you quarantine 20 kids and you know three to five of them end up sick while they're in quarantine, that's not a good sign. Um, Cases of COVID-19 are occurring in the school building within 14 days of an original case in a staff or student um, that on retrospect, you realize that they were a close contact of an initial case. Um, so you may be having trouble identifying all your close contacts. Um, the levels in the community are high enough to affect the healthcare system, the public health response as described above. So. To me, the community transmission rate really is going to affect some of the other things we've already discussed. <clears throat> so the next main bullet to look at is, is your overall absenteeism rate 25% or more? And do you educate students with high risk medical conditions, um, which may you know, make you think about going to remote earlier than later? I forgot, I, I meant to move that to a new slide because it was so crowded and I forgot to delete it. So um, I won't open it up to questions right now, 
Um, and if you want to put them in the chat box, that would be fine. But I'm kind of looking for thoughts or feedback. You know, if this would it was something you were thinking of having as kind of a thought tool or something to work with with your school board. Um, if so, it's something I can take forward. Just I was thinking of sharing it with the other medical directors <clears throat> and just see what their thoughts were. Um, but again, just just thoughts if this was something like what you were thinking about. And I just wanted to share this. I just happened to run across this. This was just published today in, um, I think, the Michigan Radio um, website. Um, you know, I we all tend to get some flack for encouraging schools to stay open. Um, apparently over 100 doctors in Ann Arbor area <clears throat> wrote a letter to the school board down there urging them to reopen their elementary schools. Um, so I just wanted to share that, that article and the letter which actually has numerous um, scientific articles cited in it. Um, just to share that, you know, I'm not, it's not just me who's encouraging these things to happen. So I'm sure you know that, those of you on the call, but it's just, just something nice to have. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, I will end this and we can get back to the presentation. Or sorry, back to the questions and answers. So let me scroll. All right, Dr. Morris, I can read the questions if you would like. Whatever works. Okay, so I hope I grabbed the first question here. It says, doesn't Public Act 238 require 14 days? We received legal advice that we should stick with, with 14 days as it is legislative and the health department guidance cannot trump that <clears throat> legislation. Thoughts? Yeah. So that refers to your employee and there has been um, a new, some new wording <clears throat> presented to the legislature. <clears throat> so hopefully that will be updated before their term, before their session ends on the 17th. But yes, for the time being, it is safest for you to stick with 14 days for employees, but for students, you can use the 10 days if you would like. Thanks for the clarification, I appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. All right, next question. Has there been a statistically significant bump or increase in cases following Thanksgiving in our region, which is DHD 10 for this question. Um, as, as you saw, I think for most of our counties, we've actually continued to have some decreases. Um, if we're gonna see it, I think we'd see it by next week. Um, I don't know if any of our nurses or um, if Jordan is on the phone, or on the meeting um, to know if we've seen any more local trends than that. This is Dr. Nefsi from Munson Healthcare. I can tell you yeah. over the last two days, we have seen a significant increase in the number of inpatients we've needed to hospitalize for COVID, and that is across the system. Yeah, and that's the trouble with some of the sites I go to for data is there's definitely a delay. So I think by this time next week, we'll probably be seeing that for sure. Thank you. All right, we'll move on. Uh, Dr. Nefsi actually posted that our legal advice has been that employees are required to adhere to yep. MIOSHA rules and follow 14-day quarantine. Yep. We have seen a significant increase in hospitalizations for COVID over the last two days. Unclear if this is a blip or pattern at this point, hoping for a blip. 
so the next question, how long does the medical community expect vaccinations to provide immunity for? I haven't seen this information. So the vaccines that we have now have really only been studied for about two months. So it's really to be determined. They're going to, they're, they will be studied still and continue to be studied um, for years, you know, years to come. Um, but we just don't know at this point. All right, a couple of slides earlier in the paragraph discussing allowing for tutoring and academic support. It states that it allows for the student to be in the school for physical and mental health. Does this allow a fitness center at a school to be used by students? No, it also says in the order that you cannot use the gyms. That physical and mental health refers primarily to providing like mental health services, or if you have um, like a health care center for the students. All right, moving on. Um, I'm just curious about why is ice skating allowable over all other sports? Is there science behind this that makes it safe? I don't know. Honestly, I think maybe somebody um, advocated for it given the time of year. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, primarily people choose to ice skate outdoors, but I honestly have no idea where that came from. All right. Hey, it's uh, Marcus Cheatham. I, I think I heard that the reason was because it was restricted to free skating. And so you're soaring around the ice all by yourself and somebody thought that would be safer. And I believe it was only outdoor skating, not indoor. So I can read it to you. It actually says gatherings at indoor or outdoor ice skating rinks are prohibited except for individual exercise or one on one instruction and occupancy is limited to 20 persons per 1000 square feet, including within the exercise space. Gatherings for the purpose of open skating are permitted only at outdoor rinks. All right, uh, next question, 25% absent students, staff, both staff shortage is the bigger issue for opening school. So the 25% of absent students is a general guidance that we have used in the past for closing for influenza. It is not an absolute rule. It's just been a guidance um, with the idea that you're not getting a whole lot of education done if you have that many students gone. Um, but as we're getting into the influenza season and the cold season, um, my thought process was that if you're seeing, you know, a quarter of your kids out sick, just in general, something's up. And that might be a good indicator to you that it's time to take a pause to in-person education to let whatever it is that's, crawling around your students to have a chance to stop being transmitted. Um, I did not put in there um, about staff shortages because um, I think that's something that you automatically know when making a decision that if you don't have enough staff, you need to go to remote education. Um, but I can add that into that um, discussion sheet or the thought process sheet, um, but I kind of thought that, you know, I think most of you know that that is certainly kind of a, a given that if you don't have enough staff, um, you need to go to remote. I was thinking more on the um, health and safety thought process. But yeah, I know that a lot of, a lot of your closures have been because um, you have a, a teacher meeting, 
And, you know, one, one educator exposes 10 others and unfortunately then you don't have anybody to teach, so. Okay, uh, Linda Van Houten made the statement that keep, keep in mind that Ann Arbor has not had the in-person instruction since March. For some reason, I don't know, it seems like their medical director had said they had opened for a short time or they were about to open or something. Um, so, but I think the message still holds. And Dr. Jeffrey says, thank you for your work. Uh, a decision-making matrix, this type of protocol is very helpful. Uh, next question, are there any restrictions for nine to 12 students once they arrive? For nine through 12 uh, okay. students once they arrive, can they stay home for more than an hour? Can they stay all day? So I haven't checked the frequently asked questions recently, but I don't believe that's addressed. I think because they can come into the building, for example, if they don't have internet connection. So in my opinion, you know, they may need to stay there the entire day to do their schoolwork. Um, that though is something I don't know the specifics to. It is not addressed in the order. Um, you could certainly send it to the state as a question, um, but in, in my thought, they should be able to stay as long as they need to for the reason, whether it's tutoring, academic assistance, or internet access. All right, Sarah asks, how updated is the county school day? Um, the data was put on there yesterday and it's typically a few days behind. So I'm trying to see a date on there and it looks like it wasn't updated. But that has been kind of the norm. Let me check the other one. So yeah, it's, it looks like that has been the standard that it's about two days behind, and that's a and it's a seven day average. It's a rolling average. So, um, so for example, when I say that, let me. Sorry, I'm clicking between screens here, and it is not going smoothly for me. So when I say that, on my first line here is Aranac. When Aranac has six hundred forty one cases per million. That's, they took the last, the prior seven days and averaged it. So on average over those seven days, that's how many cases there were. Um, that takes out the huge changes. Um, if you go to the state website, michigan.gov slash coronavirus, um, under the below the map of Michigan is a click for more data and you can actually see each county and get individual daily data as well. So Sarah followed up with then it is inaccurate for, for our county in Manistee. Well, let me pull it up right now for you. So Dr. Morse, um, to, and she's referring to school data. Is she referring to school data or to the county data as a Sarah, whole? You can hop on, Sarah. Okay. On I, I'm, hi, this is Sarah. So, um, and you showed a chart that showed school data by county. Oh, yeah. Yep. And for Manistee County, you showed four students, and I think it said like in parentheses, three high school, maybe something like that. 
and it showed zero staff. Yep. Okay. If that is accurate to the week, that is inaccurate. Okay. So, and so I'm just, when we get this data, my real question here is how up to date and accurate is it? And like, how soon is it? Because that helps drive decisions as well. Yep. So one thing is I put on the top there may not be exact. Um, okay. Between December 2nd and December 8th, and it's given to me by our epidemiologist for District 10. Okay. And it's based on the data that she has from our cases. And so there may be cases that the schools know about that we don't know about. So it's one of those situations where your data is only as good as you know. Hmm. And that I hesitated to even use those that data, mm -hmm. but I know it's probably helpful to at least sure. give people an idea, but I know that we're probably missing things. Sure. So okay. If there's if there's cases there that are missing, it may be that we weren't told about them. Or that we didn't click the right button to indicate that it was a teacher mm -hmm. um, because it's it's a computer program and you know if you don't click the right button <laughs> it doesn't tell you the right information so right yeah okay this is Jordan I'm actually the one that pulls it for district 10 so as Dr. Morse said, the data is only as good as what's in there. So, I mean, it's also possible. I mean, I, I know high schools are closed, um, but if it's not indicated that the student was a virtual learner, then all I can so, do is assume that they were in school. So, so, so I understand this correctly, because I think maybe I misunderstood the chart. It The chart is only eighth. I didn't catch part of that last sentence. Oh, the, the chart is showing data from December 2nd through 8th. Is that what you told me? Yes. Okay. That, then I didn't, I misunderstood it. I didn't catch that part. Thank you. No, that's okay. I went through it really quickly because I know it's really busy and I just, kind of expect that people will look at it when they get it. And I apologize, but I just know it's a lot of numbers. Um, that's just for the prior week from the last report. Right. And Dr. Morse, like all data, it evolves daily. The data that you're giving is a snapshot to kind of indicate a picture, but everyday data is evolving. And mm -hmm. so it's important for everybody to know where to go and how to get capture data in real time to be able to make decisions. It's, so if it's a, so today's Thursday and we're not meeting again until next Thursday and it's Tuesday now next week and you need to make a decision, you don't necessarily want to look at this chart because that's for the week of 12 2 through 12 8. you should be able to go to the data directly on, on the dashboard at the uh, michigan.gov to determine what the numbers are now right Dr. Morris, you might be on mute if you're talking. No, I'm having a situation at my home right now, so. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I missed that last question completely, so. Um, but yes, data changes, and it's hard to keep up. Yeah. So I think I'll probably just move on. <laughs> Sorry. 
That's okay. Um, and if and if those on the call aren't sure of how what the process is for looking at that data on a daily basis, reach out to us and we can walk you through the process of how to look at the dashboard, the state's dashboard and our dashboard so that you can get a better picture of things as you're making decisions. Okay, so um, the next question, do you have any thoughts on what might happen after the Christmas break is over? For example, do you think that they will extend the break with mandatory virtual instruction due to concerns about gatherings over the holiday? I wouldn't even hazard a guess. I don't know if any of our health officers on the call want to, but um, I haven't known anything one second sooner than you guys have. So I have a feeling that our health officers are they might know things a half hour sooner than you guys do, <laughs> but half hour, um, half hour for lucky. Yeah. <laughs> so honestly, don't know. Really, don't know. All right. Um, ne next question: How is it that Planet Fitness is open for use, but a high school fitness center or weight room is not? They, if I remember the order correctly, they can only have one family in there at a time or something. Um, I'd have to go back. I honestly didn't pay that much attention to that um, <clears throat> since the first time it came out, just because I was more worried about knowing the school rules for you guys. Um, does anyone else on the, the call remember the gym rules? But it seems to me it's only one family at a time or something like that. Well, Dr. Morse, that was the last question in the chat box. Is there any other questions? Are there any other questions that you'd like to add to the chat or just unmute yourself and ask? I'm not hearing any. All right. <clears throat> well, I will tweak that um, decision making list. Um, like I said, have some other colleagues look at it and then get that out. Um, it may not come with, well, the version you saw will be on the slides when we send them out, but this might come a little later. And then again, if you're interested in taking part in that press release, feel free to email me. And again, it likely won't go out till early in the year. Um, other than that, I think we still have one more week to go, don't we? Yes. So we'll meet again next Thursday. Um, have a good weekend, everybody. <clears throat> hey, Dr. Morris. Yeah. I did find that exercise facilities piece. Oh. And gatherings must not exceed 25% of the total occupancy limits established by the state fire marshal or local fire marshal. And there has to be at least 12 feet of distance between each oh. occupied workout station. So. Yeah. I don't think there's enough room in a high school gym for that, but I mean, in the, like the weight rooms and things, but I don't know. We don't make the rules. All right. We'll have a great, what's that? Thank you. Yeah. <gasps> have a great weekend, everybody.